Welcome everybody to today's football podcast. I'm Hassan and uh, I'm here with Ali. Ali, welcome. Uh, today's podcast, we're going to be discussing all of the latest uh, happenings in Iraqi football. Uh, if you've been following my website, iraqfootball.me, you'll know that there's a lot of controversy surrounding Iraqi football. We're going to be looking at uh, various issues as well as uh, the Bahrain game and the first uh, fixture of the World Cup qualifiers alongside with Hong Kong and Cambodia, both games finishing in the last seven days. Um, we're going to be talking about what it means for us to see football return to Iraq, Basra specifically, alongside a whole bunch of other issues surrounding um, Mimi being a superstar of the team, what it means for expats to be in the Iraqi team and the struggles they face, alongside uh, other issues. So, um, just a quick shout out as well to um, Laith and Naimi. Laith, uh, I wish you could have been here, but unfortunately you couldn't make it. Hopefully next time. I uh, just want to also say a big well done to Soccer Iraq and all the good stuff they do for the Iraqi national team. And we'll start off with talking about the Bahrain game. So the Bahrain game was a while back. We'll keep it very brief in how we talk about this. 1-1 um, one, one, away game. What did you think of the performance and the result? I think the performance was good. I mean, um, we had most of the possession. We created a lot of chances. Um, Bahrain aren't a weak team um, historically, and we aren't. We haven't had a great record against Bahrain. However, I think the performance was good. Um, if you would have given me a draw before the game, I would have said okay, fair enough. But we dominated Bahrain. We should have won that game. And it would have been a disaster if we came home with no points. But Mimi, big player, big performance, big goal. And we're still on target to qualify to the next stage. Um, I think this is where I kind of differ with the kind of narrative that Iraq should be grateful for one point. I think... Um Obviously, I'm saying this on the back of Bahrain beating Iran, who are the group favourites, but I don't think they're a particularly good team. I know our record against them isn't amazing, but we we should have won that game comfortably. And you could you could say that we would have done so if it wasn't for Hamid's disastrous performance. And No doubt. I mean, Hamid in himself is a whole different podcast altogether. We could just, <laughs> I could spend two hours talking about why he shouldn't be in the national team. And... Fortunately, as you mentioned earlier, Mimi came to the rescue. I think in terms of performance, it wasn't it wasn't amazing. We did dominate possession. Did we really create any proper chances? Not really. I mean, uh, aside from Saad Natuk heading the ball over every time we had a corner, but we had a, a few chances. We had but, Justin Miram. Yeah, but how many of them were clear-cut? This is my, my biggest issue yes, with they, Iraq football, is that we, we failed to create clear-cut chances they weren't when clear-cut it, true. Yeah, whenever we create chances it's always off the back of a defensive error or uh, like a piece of magic from Mimi or in that case there was Ali Adnan that set up a goal we just we, we are unable to create these clear-cut chances uh, I was talking to Yusuf uh, Khafaji you guys know him from uh, Iraqi pro players shout out to big Yusuf and um we were just discussing like the kind of lack of creativity in the national team. Yeah, we lack a number 10 behind the striker. Yeah, and I think the fact that we've, we don't really score tap-ins really indicates a big problem in the, uh, in the national team. Mm-hmm. You never see like somebody running down the wing and just passing it back across for an easy goal. Like If Iraq score, it's either going to be headed in or it's going to be like a, a penalty or a piece of magic. I'm thinking of like Ali Adnan's free kick against Vietnam in the last second. So who do you think is to blame for that? Um, I think a lot of people are to blame for that, but we'll get to that in a bit. So it was a point in, against Bahrain, and then we uh, we had the big one, football returning to Iraq, and hosting in Basra against Hong Kong. 
What do you think it meant for football to return to Iraq in, in that way? I think it's massive because we haven't had a game on Iraqi home soil for eight years. Well, that's an competitive. Offic- yeah. An official, yeah. So to see the team that you grew up supporting, grew up watching, it was a massive moment because you see other nations and how well prepared they are, how they try and maximize their opportunity to qualify for the World Cup. You feel that Iraq always lagged behind because because of travel. They either played in the Emirates, they either played in Qatar, in they either Iran. played in Iran, yeah. on terrible pitches as well. I think that's the key thing. Uh, the lack of support from home fans makes a massive difference. Like whenever you watch previous Iraq games, uh, it's in a stadium that's, like you can literally hear the players talking. It's yeah, quite embarrassing. A thousand or something. Yeah, exactly. Um, on the other hand, the quality of pitches is atrocious, especially games in Iran. Uh, for players like Justin Miram and Ahmed Yassin and Osama Rashid, like players that rely on dribbling and technique, it's very hard for them to perform on those pitches because the, the, it's difficult to control the ball. The ball bubbles across and... When fans ask, oh, why hasn't Justin performed the same way as Ahmed? Well, this is part of it. This is part and parcel of why these players are unable to perform. And I'm not saying this only affects ex- expats, but um, it affects Everyone. the whole players. Yeah, exactly. The whole squad. To see football return to, to Iraq on a proper playing surface with fans there. And I think at that moment as well, with the, with the protests, uh, it was... It was what the country needed, I think, in terms of just settling everybody down and uh, uniting them against uh, an opposition, in this case, Hong Kong. Since, yeah, I mean, since the Bahrain game, part of you thinks that, you know, it might not even go on with external factors. Um, even during the summer when there was an apparent FIFA document saying that um, official matches won't be going on in Basra, I think only in Arbil or something like that. But thankfully it did... Um, we did um, witness Iraq finally play on, on home soil and um, yeah, it was massive to everyone, the fans, the players. And yeah, I, I can't wait until hopefully maybe the next two games, where which are both going to be in Basra, hopefully they're sold out. I mean, this the atmosphere looked amazing. But it was only half full. Exactly. So uh, you wonder what will happen once we have a full packed out stadium. Exactly. One way to find out. So let's actually look at the squad for Iraq over the two games between uh, Hong Kong and Cambodia, right? What did you make of uh, Mohamed Hamid starting in goal for both games? Uh, I know you're a big fan of him after all, aren't you? Yeah, um, Mohamed Hamid's number one fan. I think with goalkeepers, confidence is a massive thing. That was sarcasm, by the way. <laughs> for our uh, American viewers who <laughs> don't uh, necessarily understand sarcasm. Anyway, shout out to Lil Haider. Um, going into the game, I think... Yeah, like I said, goalkeepers' confidence is a massive thing. Um, I think if Mohamed Hamid was dropped for the game against uh, Hong Kong in front of our home fans, I think that would have shattered his confidence. Um, Notably, Osama Rashid was omitted from the squad. Um, What do you think of that? Before I go into Osama, I just want to discuss Mohamed Hamid, right? I, I understand this idea that if he was dropped, it would have destroyed his confidence and all of that, but... Those two games would have been a perfect kind of uh, way to introduce a new goalkeeper. I mean, Fahad Talib was um, was uh, recalled into the squad after a lengthy absence. He did really good in the 2016 Olympics. And, I mean, he's not really been tried at, at the top level. It, it, for me, if there was an opportunity for him to really be trialled at, that would have been it. The two games, easy, quite, like, uh, quite cushy games for him to find his feet before the next two uh, kind of group deciders, essentially, versus Bahrain and Iran. And we ended up with uh, Mohamed Hamid staying uh, and playing. Over two games. Over two games, both of which he made notable mistakes. Exactly. And at international level, you can't afford to make these mistakes because World Cup qualification is all about small margins. You cannot make those mistakes. Especially when you're Iraq and you fail to create anything meaningful anyway. Um, So that's Mohamed Hamid discussed. You asked me about Osama Rashid. Anyone who follows my Twitter page and my website, shout out to my, my Twitter handle. Follow me if you're listening to this uh, at Iraq underscore football underscore. And you'll know that I'm a massive fan of Osama. 
I think he's an incredible footballer who's proven himself across various leagues in Europe at the highest level. Probably right now, out of all the Iraqi footballers, he's the one playing at the highest uh, competitive level, which is Portugal's A-League in his second season. And I find it bizarre that this player just struggles to get games for Iraq. Is, is Osama Rashid really inferior to players like Mehdi Kamil? and Amjad Atwan and Homam Tarak. I mean, Bashar I kind of like, right? But again, there's a lot of question marks around Bashar. I don't think he's proven himself uh, at the highest level for the Iraqi national team. He's, he's done really well at Perspolis in the Iranian league. But when it comes to Iraq, he's more often than not, he vanishes. He doesn't show his he, club form with his national team. Yeah, he vanishes. Team, yeah. He doesn't, doesn't turn up. And I don't think it's good enough. But... Uh, it comes on to the idea that expat footballers are treated differently in terms of they're barely given any chances for the national team to perform. Whereas players like Amjad and Mehdi, uh, they're given unlimited opportunities to, to perform. And even if they have a bad spell, they're kept in the team. And whereas if you compare it to the expats, first opportunity and they're gone. It's just all shocking. Well, what did you think of the inclusion of um, Ibrahim Bayesh, for example? I really like Ibrahim Baish. I think he's a an engine. He'll run for the whole length of the game. He'll um, give you energy. He'll give you chances. And you're, you're a big fan of uh, Ahmed Jalal as well, aren't you? Ahmed Jalal is a tricky winger. He's he's got the steppies. He's unbelievably creative, but he's doesn't play behind the striker, which is where we need creativity. He's more of a winger, and. I think in that department, it's very hard to get a starting position, uh, especially with um, Humam Tarak and... and you always buy it? another another wing. But hang on, we're, we're talking about uh, Ahmed Jalal, right? And we're talking about a squad that was missing Justin and Ahmed Yassin. Both of them were missing due Justin to Maram, different reason. Justin Maram's... Uh, exclusion was because he had a he didn't come out officially and say the reason why he didn't make the squad or he um, took himself out of the squad but there were rumours that he did speak to Basil Gargis who's like a liaison between the yeah. expat players and the um, the Iraqi staff Yeah. so the reason was he had a important game with his club uh, in the MLS however it begs the question of if Ali Adnan can make the squad or rather he was played then why did he but this is, this take is, himself out this is where I disagree with you because Ali Adnan's season's over okay whereas um, Justin's playing for a side that's qualified for the playoffs right and he's got important fixtures coming up and you're asking a player like that to leave his club, the club that pays him a living, where he's worked hard to establish himself, because he's not at Columbus Crew anymore. Okay, he's had to work hard to make himself a starting player. And again, this is the club that pays his wages. For him to leave, fly 25 hours to make a game uh, in Iraq, and then go to Cambodia, and then fly from Cambodia all the way back to the US, which is literally on the other side of the world. I think it's it's absurd, and what I, what I think people aren't understanding is that these players, they have on average like two to three layovers. Okay, these guys are not flying first class. It's the Iraq FA, they're booking them economy. Okay, so I I think it's absurd that we have these expectations that these players have to live and die for Iraq. Look. I appreciate the idea that we love our country and uh, the players love our country as much as we do. But at the end of the day, this is a guy who also has a club career that he needs to think about. And I, I completely understand Justin making the decision that, no, I'm not going to make it this time. Um, Ahmed Yassin is a whole different issue. I was speaking to Rawan Amin, who also plays in the Swedish league. And his club played uh, Hakan which is Ahmed Yassin's club, the day or the day before the, he flew out. Okay, and I spoke to Rowan, I told him, listen, how was, uh, how was Ahmed Yassin today? And he told me, man, he's a hell of a player, but he, he came off injured. Mm. 
Mm. Now, when Rawan told me this, it's confirmation. And Rawan didn't even know about the about Ahmed withdrawing from the from the national team. It just proved to me that what happened was legit. But apparently, even despite the the medical letter that was sent to to the Iraq national team by Hakan and Ahmed Yasin. That's not a good enough excuse for the Iraqi fans, or some of them at least, and the national team. What would you want a player to do? Fly 25 hours so they could not train and not play. The guy is injured. Again, if the if he was a local player, I very much doubt he would be treated in such a kind of um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a kind of like a criminal essentially. Like he's committed a crime against the national team. I think the problem is. A lack of communication with the fans. The domestic and uh, journalists and the domestic um, media, they sort of put words into players' mouths, especially the expat players, because their main viewers are the Iraqis in Iraq. So they don't actually get a perspective of the reasons why they omit themselves from the team. So... I think it is a communication issue. Maybe the FA are covering up because if they were, if the fans were to understand what goes on behind the scenes and they were given full transparency, I think the FA would be in a massive dilemma. Well, I think uh, the FA are in a massive dilemma anyway. I can't even imagine what would happen if they actually had transparency. Um, but I mean, is that really an excuse? You have my website out there which interviews a lot of the expat footballers. You have Soccer Iraq, mashallah, they've got a fantastic following. You've got Iraqi pro players, nearly 2 million followers on, on uh, Facebook. Uh, if, I don't know how much it would be if you add in all their Instagram and all that sort of nonsense. Is that your third plug, by the way? It might be. It might be. You're what welcome, What are we talking guys. about next? I don't know. Let's, uh, let's go to the match reviews anyway. So listen, what did you think of the performance against Hong Kong? The result and performance. I think it was very important to get the three points against Hong Kong, especially on home soil. I think your home matches are where you should pick up your points in the World Cup qualification campaign. I think the performance wasn't great. At times it was very cyclical in terms of trying to overrun the defence instead of trying to play it out from the wing. I think the headline of the game was Mimi and... 10 others I think Mimi was the star of the show yes yeah. he missed the penalty but big players make up for their mistakes during the game and boy did he make up yeah so um, I think you're right in, in talking about the, the results being important especially after we dropped points against Bahrain when I personally think we should have walked away with all three but in front of home fans we managed to grab uh, the three points. But I think it was just a terrible performance. It was a terrible performance because it was an opportunity for Katanich to kind of say, OK, I've been here for a year now, over a year. This is what my club can do. This is what my players perform like. This is, this is the system I've put into place. And we didn't see any of that. The fans want to see a game plan, they, especially at home. They want to see how we're going to play against the big boys of Asia. Well, I don't, I don't even think they're big boys. I think, I think Hong Kong will have a population of 9 million. Not in terms right? of Hong Kong, but, but I mean, there has is, to be a, some sort of game plan. Yes, but this is exactly what I mean, right? We're playing these kind of minnows, Hong Kong and Cambodia. And, uh, with, like, all with, with all due respect to my uh, listeners that might be from these countries. These are not exactly the creme de la creme of Asian football, okay? And we're still struggling to really produce any meaningful performances. Uh, if we look at the Hong Kong game, where did the goals come from? Well, the first penalty came from uh, a very good cross. I think it was Bashar that played it in. I think for, it was from the right. It was, no, it was from the left. Was it, came it? In, uh, came into Hamam, who made the run, yes, and he was, was pulled down. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure it was Bashar. Uh, again, penalty. That's how right? boring the game was. I can't remember yeah. if it was the left or the right. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, you know, it's, bit, it's depressing when this is the things you're discussing on a podcast. <laughs> But the the actual goal itself, I mean, hang on, th that penalty was really poorly taken from Mimi. 
That but, was Ronaldo esque. Is you know he fainted once, he fainted yeah, twice. He's he's not Ronaldo, <laughs> and uh, I think we saw that with the save. But the goal itself was incredible. Uh, it was Baish down the left. He played a delightful cross, amazing uh, header across the goal. Beat two defenders. Yeah, out jumped them exactly, and I think that's mm. yet another goal for Mimi on on the big stage when when Iraq are needing a player to step up. He is always there. He and bails them out. He bails them out. And uh, it's, it's Mimi FC, essentially. <laughs> okay. The, the second goal itself, the, the second penalty, again, Mimi, amazing run down the, um, down the right. Brought down after some trickery. Uh, Ali Adnan stepped up and, and scored the penalty. He didn't just score, he ripped the net. He did rip the net, indeed. But there's still both goals, or three of the main chances... It wasn't from open play. It, well, well, it was from open play, but it wasn't from creative football. It yeah. wasn't from a game plan. It came from... Any other player, when Bayesh or Bashar crossed the ball in, wouldn't have scored. Exactly. You gave that to Eamon Hassan, he would have probably tried and bicycle kicked it. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think this is all part of an indication that we lack a clear, concise game plan. Okay? And when it came to the Cambodia match, I think the problems were still clear as ever. So well, we went into the Cambodia game on four points. Yep. Cambodia just being torn apart 14-0 by the Iranians, mm. uh, who we can assume are comfortable favourites for the group, even despite their loss to Bahrain uh, on the same day as the Cambodia match, right? Yeah. What did you make of that performance? We made them look like professional footballers in the first few <laughs> minutes. Okay. Honestly, our team that just was battered 14-0 a few days ago. Shouldn't have been made to look anything more than semi-pro. I mean, when, when people use the word Farmers League to describe <laughs> the French League, I'm not sure what that makes the Cambodian League. I mean, these, these are not footballers. These are guys that do it as a hobby. But to be fair, what does that say about Ali, Ala Abdul Zahra if he can't score against a bunch of farmers? But this is the thing, right? We're talking about the squad selection. And to see Ala Abdul Zahra come back into contention for a position, it's ridiculous. And it shows that there's a serious lack of planning in the, in the national team. Why is Ala Abdul Zahra, who's got like a million caps and barely done anything of note? I think not, he's got no. like 15 goals in 200 games and he's a designated striker. I don't know about no, it's not 200, but it's about, it's about nine, uh, 100, I think, <laughs> right? Or in the 90s. I may have somewhere. overestimated by 100. But yeah, yeah. He, he came off after 60 minutes um, for Safa Hadi, who, whose birthday it was the day before, and he turned about maybe somewhere between 20 and 25. So Yeah, it was somewhere there. But that's, that's just part and parcel of Iraqi football and... The, the lack of planning involved by the national team. So let's get back to the how the game. One second, out. one second. Let me let me just discuss this point very quickly. You've got a player who's, I mean, what's what's he on paper? Like thirty one. Which who? Ala Abdul Zara. Thirty one plus four. Four or five or six at least, right? <laughs> You've got a player that's hardly in his prime. Like passed it years ago. I don't think he was ever it anyway, whatever it <laughs> no, was. Let's, let's be fair. He, he, he was good when he was a young player. He was, he was good. Uh, well, I never rated him. But anyway, he's called back into the national team. Why? I don't know. You've got players like Ala Abbas who need to be given a chance to prove themselves. Give them a chance. Give them some game time. Let them find their feet. What is the point in bringing back a dinosaur? Yeah, I think that's the last we should see. I mean, we should have seen the last of him ages ago, but I think even he knows that was the last th that he's ever going to be seen because he came off after 60 minutes against the lowest ranked team, one of the lowest ranked teams in Asia. Didn't really create anything. And But the problem is, is that we're probably going to end up bringing somebody else back, like uh, Mohamed Abdul Rahim, another proven failure, another player who's had a billion chances and done nothing. And... It's, I, I feel sorry, like if I was a player like, like Ala, uh, Abbas. Ala Abbas and uh, I'm seeing these players come in, getting a chance ahead of me and nobody's willing to give me a game time. What would I be thinking? I mean, I don't even want to get into what Jilwan was thinking. Jilwan, uh, pff, six years I've been waiting for this guy. Six years I've been waiting for him to come and represent the national team. And he gets, what, 30 minutes against Hong Kong and not a single minute against Cambodia. It's absolutely embarrassing. And for what? To watch Ala Abdul Zahra run about a pitch 
for 60 minutes. And I say run, it's mostly walking. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous. But anyway, uh, alas, I digress. How did you, how did you, what did you think of the game? I think it was absolute shambles. Again, another game where we failed to demonstrate any tactical game plan or structure or kind of like a an identity. This yeah. is the, this is the main thing. It we lack an identity. the question: Where is the an analytical team? I mean, well, they forget, knew. Like, where's the coaching? Where is the coaching? Where are the the training? What is happening in the training sessions that the players don't have a clear idea of how to play football? Are we a counter attacking team? Do we play like Gargan pressing kind of um, Klopp Liverpool Klopp esque? Yeah. Do we play as a kind of possession team? Do we rely on wing play the same way like United Manchester United did in the nineteen ninety nine uh, season? What what is our style of play? Because every time I see Arak play, it's just the midfield is absent. The ball goes from side to side without any real purpose. Um, it goes just from like the uh, against Hong Kong. You had two walls of four in terms of the defence in the midfield of Hong Kong and all the football that was being played by Arak was in front of that uh, those two banks. Okay, There were no runs from midfield trying to create space in the opposition half. There was no creative passes in between trying to rip apart the defence. It just it, it just looked so basic. like The ball was just static. going side to side, completely static. And I think it all comes down to coaching, Lack of quality and a lack of identity. And Amjad Atwan. And Amjad Atwan, <laughs> lest we forget. Oh, he scored a banger. Yeah, he did score a banger. But, to but be I honest, mean, uh, there's a saying if you throw enough dirt, some of it will stick. Yeah, okay? he, he takes a shot, pretty, like he takes two shots, th two or three shots every game. I mean, one was bound to go in. Yeah, eventually, yeah. after numerous deaths to birds all across the world. <laughs> Shout out whoever was that uh, messaged me that tweet that cracked me up. <laughs> 4-0, right? I've calmed down a bit now. 4-0 and three points. But, again, if you break down the performance, right? You had for half the game, players trying to be selfish, shooting from distance, right? Static midfield. And let's examine again where the goals came from. You had the first one, which was a header by Baish, okay? Um... You had the second one, which was a Mimi header, if I'm not mistaken. Ali Adnan Cross. Ali Adnan Cross. You had the third one, which was... Um, MJ Atwan's MJ, usual... MJ, King MJ, his, um, his uh, thunder strike. But um, he can try that shot a million times, he'll never score that goal again. <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't care. I don't care how many people are convinced that he's the answer. I will never he understand. He put his fingers in his ear as if to say, I'm not listening to all the criticism. Yeah, yeah, to all the haters. Mate, <laughs> where do I start with that guy? Where do I stop? Anyway, forget forget that. The point was, that goal was an abnormality. We don't score goals like that. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then back to the fourth goal. Again, another header. Captain Fantastic. No, so that's that's how many... But what how, does that tell you? It tells one you second, that's four headers out of the six. One penalty and one thunder strike. Okay, six goals. None of them were like team goals that we could score on a regular. Because Hong Kong and Cambodia, Southeast Asians, notably, notoriously short, small individuals. Compared to us, okay. Now, you're not you're not gonna go score those headers against Bahrain. We saw in the first game. Look how many crosses we put in that game. Like a million, and we barely scored one. It just indicates a lack of a game plan. I mean, I don't mind winning 4-0 just by crossing the ball in, but surely that should tell you that, you know, this will work. Why don't you try it the whole game instead of trying to run past the well-organized defense? And Cambodia, give them credit. They were they had a game plan. They had, they had a they better were, game plan than us. They Their pressing was unbelievable. Their passing, their... Um, they dictated the midfield. I mean, they overran Mjid Atwan, which wasn't a surprise, but was a surprise at the same time because that shouldn't be happening. Then again, it's Mjid Atwan. Yeah. So there's always that. I th I don't know. For me, it just also they they made a lot of defensive mistakes. They but this is it, right? All our goals come from defensive mistakes. It's I know, not... but you can only score a goal against how 
well your opponent is. I mean, I understand that. I understand that. But these are the kind of games where we need to be really highlighting the progress we've made over the last year or so under Katanich. And, you know, credit where it's due, Katanich's record is very, very good. Performances, however, have not been. You know, it's funny because it used to be the other way around. We used to have good performances, but we wouldn't necessarily get the points necessary. I mean, if you're talking about Radish Nesha, then I completely agree. I think we're, under him, we actually started to have a game plan. We started to dictate games. We yeah. started to look like a more comfortable side. He was a pragmatic coach as well. He was very well organised defensively. But stability and Araqi FA don't go well together. Yep. And I think on that note, <laughs> let's move on. So we've talked a bit about the match reviews. I just want to really talk about Mimi. Like, this guy is unbelievable. This guy is such he's, a he's not a complete footballer, but he's he's quality. He shouldn't be a complete footballer by by now. But he's, for me, I know this is a big statement, but I think he can be greater than Yunus Mahmoud. I think he's got more to his locker than Yunus did. No taking away anything from Yunus, but Mohamed Ali, I haven't actually seen us produce a striker of his quality. He's strong, he's good on the ball, good hold-up play, very good technique. Yeah, and he just uh, he just broke his kind of uh, rut in, in Qatar as well. Yep. He, he scored an amazing goal. Yeah. So I can't wait to see what, uh, what the future has for him. So anyway, right, six points out of six, seven points overall out of three games. And yet, you know, fans still sound disappointed and they still are quite, quite uh, upset or feeling unfulfilled. Underperforming. Compar Underwhelmed, I think is the word I'm looking for. C comparing our performances and our results with the our rivals. I mean... I think Bahrain only beat Cambodia 1-0. Um, I mean, to be fair, Iran only beat Hong Kong 2-0 as well. But they were, they were they away. They were away, yeah. So it does... It's the, the thing is, it sounds like Iran are not performing too well as well. But... I don't know. It's, it's very hard to be excited by this, this national team. And for me, in terms of being a football fan, it's quite depressing. Because I also support Man United. <laughs> so seeing both your teams just... Just failing to perform properly, failing to to have an identity, it's quite depressing. But anyway, despite all that, the the whole talk during the after the game and during the game was about and before Jilwan, right? Mm -hmm. So Jilwan, he, he's joined the Iraq national team after an extended period of him uh, not wanting to play for Iraq for various reasons. Check out my website; there's an in-depth interview with him. But he finally, he finally represents Iraq and he gets to come on for 30 minutes against Hong Kong, right? Nobody passes him the ball. Now, at first... That's childish, I, isn't I it? I thought, hang on, I thought I was imagining it, right? And I go online and I see people actually mentioning the same thing. That, hang on, these players are not passing the ball to Jilwan. Disclaimer, I will say this. When a player joins a new team, it's very normal for them to kind of have trust issues with that player. But It's like a transitional period. Yeah, I understand that. Getting but, to know your teammates. And but everything. then again, that doesn't happen when a local player joins the national team. That local player doesn't have to earn anybody's trust. But Jilwan comes in as an outsider. Uh, the only two expats in the group were Rebin, Sulaqa and, uh, and Jilwan. And Ali Adnan, if you count him as a... I don't, I don't count him. I don't count him because he's I mean, he's, he probably speaks better English than Arabic at the moment. Have you heard him speak English? I have. I have, but that's a different issue. Um, if anybody missed it, there's a video of Ali Adnan feeding his, his teammates at uh, Vancouver, like an Iraqi breakfast. Amazing. Biryani. And, like, yeah, I was disappointed there was no Bagila Yeah. or Gamer Rukahi, at least. But anyway, I digress. Let's go back to Jilwan. So Jilwan comes in. He doesn't receive the ball. What did you think of that? Like I said, I think it's very childish. I mean, this is like the basics. You find a teammate in space, you pass in the ball. And he was making some amazing runs, by the way. Like, we talk about the lack of movement in midfield. He was doing exactly what Iraq needs. 
running through the channels, trying to create gaps, and just the players were refusing to pass him the ball. I mean, if you could tell the difference between the way Jilwan plays and the other midfielders around him, bar Safa Hadi, because I absolutely love Safa Hadi. I think he's better than Kante. I think... Don't know about that. On the same level. I think Jilwan, it's more natural for him. He doesn't have to think about where he should move or whether he should pass the ball a certain way it's That's it shows thing. that he's he's his training and his career that he's played yeah, with the top awareness, levels yeah. yeah it's just it's a completely different level to what we have and these are the kind of players we need to be utilizing and instead you have players that are playing at that level not even being included in the national team so Jilwan getting 30 minutes against um, against Hong Kong where he doesn't see the ball and then not even getting minutes against Cambodia. It's just inexcusable, right? The Iraqi national team right now could have one of the best squads in Asia by far, okay? Imagine, imagine we called up all the big guns that we have, you know? All the talents. We bring in, for example, Jilwan. You bring in Rawan Amin. You bring in Ahmed Yassin. Osama Rashid, Justin Miram, you bring in Rabin Sulaka, you bring in Franz Botros, okay? Uh, maybe, hopefully, we even get this young kid in Brighton, uh, Gorgis, who's, uh, who's recently made his debut for, for the Brighton first team. This, these are serious players that, at, that train at Top a levels. completely different level to what the players in Iraq train at. Different regiments, different... Yeah, just different tactical awareness as well. It's, professionalism it's, yeah it's that. just such difference in caliber i mean i'm not one to downplay the domestic because we've seen mimi we've seen safa hadi but mimi's one in, one in a generation right safa hadi i like safa uh Durgham, but I, Durgham is a quality player yeah okay I, I ali adnan that. as well ali adnan as well but how often these players come through true it's not true. often they okay. no, normally the the story is they do well at youth level when for various they're, reasons. When they're about 25. <laughs> for the under 21s. Yeah. But um, when they do get to the national team, their level does... Stagnate. Yeah. But I'm not someone who thinks that just because you play outside, you automatically have the right to play. Neither, neither am I. But, but the thing is, when you use the same parameters and when you compare domestic players with expat players, they aren't given the same chance. Or the same treatment. Yeah. Okay. And Jilwan was. Uh, if you're the better player, then you should play regardless. It doesn't matter. Absolutely. I I I'm of the belief that just because a player is an expat, it does not automatically qualify you to a starting eleven position. But these players deserve an equal chance. Okay. And Jilwan didn't get that. Rebin Suraka two games didn't even feature. Why bring him? And they made a scapegoat as well. If our performance doesn't isn't as up to the standards as Iraqi fans exactly. think we we should be exactly. Okay. And that plays into the hands of, of the media. Shout out to Haider Zeki, who has a large following because he creates controversy. And the reason why people like that are in top jobs is because without controversy, there's no stories, there's no, there's no getting people to talk about certain yeah, issues. You don't get those interactions on social media exactly. and those viewers. But I mean, I wouldn't put past. Haider Zeki to be receiving bribes from certain players or certain individuals just yes, to I mean just he, to maintain a certain narrative. I mean, I laugh, now. I laugh, but it's very, it's a very sad state because they there's players out there, and most of the Iraqi fans they know which players shouldn't be playing, and yet play every single game, whether it's an important game, whether it's uh, a game against Cambodia. No disrespect to them. It's it's unfair. That's the bottom line. It's not. It, there's no justice in 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 this treatment of, of of these players. And I think a lot of that is down to the FA, and I think a lot of it is comes to Katanich as well, who we'll discuss in a bit more depth afterwards. But um, after the, after the Cambodia game, we we finished top of the group, that, thanks to Bahrain finishing uh, yeah, the we, Iran game with one 0 victory, right? Some people were talking about it like it was a good result for Iraq. I'm not too sure about that. I agree with you. Um, we were top of the group with a few hours until the Bahrain-Iran game. I think Bahrain winning the game was the worst result in terms of 
competing with Iraq for the second place. Bahrain have taken maximum points of Iran. We haven't played Iran. And I can't see us being them, to be honest with you. Think, but no one expected Bahrain to beat Iran either. I think Bahrain are a lot more organized than they are. Than us, they are, I wouldn't say better, they are more organized. But in front of a 60,000 packed stadium, hopefully, I think Iraq could cause Iran problems. Iran do have their weaknesses against an organized team. We aren't an organized team, but anything can happen. I think, in terms of the two games, it's very important that we get at least four points because of the coming up games against Bahrain and Iran, and they're very and they will make or break our campaign. Yeah, so these games are both going to be held in Basra. Uh, they're going to be played in November. I think November the fourteenth or something. Check my website; the the fixtures are there. Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right. If these if these games, if we don't get at least four points, then it, we might as well just pack our bags because we're not going to qualify. I'm about to say it. I think if we don't get four points, I think they'll sack Katanich. I I think that'll be perfectly reasonable. The only thing that will stop me from thinking so is I can't imagine the FA will pay up their contract. That's that, right. Because I know there's a clause in there saying that if he does get sacked, they'll uh, they'll pay a certain amount and it's about $1 million or something. Yeah. It's not a small sum. And for the Iraq FA, who are like broke essentially, I think they won't do that. I think Katanish well, doesn't have anything to lose. I think by putting a clause into someone's contract, it's essentially a insurance that, you know what, if I don't make it, then I don't make it. I'm going to be paid regardless. Yeah, so there's an incentive or a dis- disincentive for Katanich in that sense. But anyway, um, Jilwan didn't get a chance. Rebin didn't get a chance. And then straight after the game, we find out what? Yasin, Ahmed Yasin, Osama Rashid and Justin Miram are no longer available to be selected by the national team. So Osama Rashid, Justin Miram and Ahmed Yasin being not available for selection. I don't think it's that they weren't available. I think it was that they're told they are no longer to be considered as part uh, of the national team. For for uh, In the case of Yasin and Justin, they weren't available for this game, even though both had perfectly reasonable uh, reasons to be away. Osama Rashid being Osama Rashid, always a scapegoat, always has been, always will be. I think he's played something like 22 games since making his debut for the Iraq national team in 2011. Mm. Meanwhile, players like Mehdi Kamil and Osama Rashid uh, and uh, Amjad Adwan given a billion chances to play. So it was heartbreaking to see that, man. Um, all three of them are extremely talented. All three of them uh, could play a massive part in Iraq's qualifying uh, campaign. <sighs> They're important games. You need yeah, your so, best so, players. So, so we're going into the Iran, uh, Iranian game and the Bahrain game. Next two fixtures in November with three of our best players missing. Based on the way Jilwan was treated, you don't even know if he's going to be called up. You don't know if Robin Saluk is going to be called up. So we're going to go into these games on the back of, yes, victories but playing Iran and Bahrain is a very different game to playing against Hong Kong and, Hong Cambodia. Kong and Cambodia okay and like uh, like we said earlier if we do- drop points against Iran if we drop points against Bahrain it's game over okay and to see these three players mistreated like this just because they're expats it's it's what I describe as an all-out war against expat footballers okay and it's unacceptable so, I think right now you could you could kind of separate Iraqi football into two kind of categories. Those that want what's best for Iraq and those that only care about themselves. Probably okay. those who have never, they're not even interested in football. No, I, of course they have their own kind of interests at heart. Okay, so like I mean people like Haider Zeki and these kind of individuals are always in the media stirring up controversies talking nonsense about expat players, trying to create this narrative that we don't need them. It's nonsense, okay? These players are Iraqi, they all wear the same shirt. I don't care where they're born, okay? They are entitled to play for the national team. They perform 100%. When I speak to players, and I've spoken to this one particular conversation I had that really stuck to me. I'm not going to mention who the player was, but I told them, listen, how do you... How do you wear that shirt every single time, despite all the nonsense people talk about you? 
And he tells me, bro, the only reason I do it is because I care about the Iraqi fans. And they show me so much love that I just want to repay them and I want to make them happy. There's nothing else in it for me. Because these players get these ridiculous flights. They go to training. They're treated as second-class citizens. Some of the players in the first team, the local players, don't even talk to them. They don't pass to them in training. As you saw with the Jilwan, in the game itself, they don't pass to them. They're so imagine how worse it is in training. Yeah, exactly. That's in front of cameras. Imagine training, what it's like. And then despite all this nonsense, they, they, they are expected to pack up and go to the national team and perform 100%. And if they don't perform 100%, they're kicked out on the first opportunity. It's no wonder Justin doesn't want to fly to Iraq and play. Because why should he when he's treated like this? It's, it's a war right now. And it's up to fans to speak up against this FA and to a certain extent the manager who is, whether it's him following orders or just being a yes man, we need to speak up on behalf of these players. It's as simple as that. Otherwise, Iraq football is not going to progress. So I was going through Twitter and I saw an interesting comment saying that Behrouz being the agent of the coach might be a problem. What do you think of that? Look, I need to be very careful because I love Behrouz. He's a very nice guy. Um, he's always been amazing to me when I've met him. Um, he's the former agent of Neshda Karam and he's the agent of Katanich now. Okay, so I'm not saying anything negative about Bahroz, especially if he's listening. <laughs> but I'll, I'll be honest with you, like, it's like my relationship with, his, with him is the point that I texted him a couple of days ago. Okay, so it's not anything against Bahroz, the more I say now. But I think there is a clear conflict of interest with Bahroz uh, being the agent of several players in the Iraqi national team and Katanich. Now, I am not implying that Bahroz has made the, the manager make these decisions. What I am saying is that even subconsciously, the manager might be making decisions that will be in the interest of Bahroz. Bahroz's job is to make money through uh, transferring footballers. Representing to, them. Yeah, representing and transfer, transferring them to different clubs, right? So it makes sense that Katanich would be doing favours for Bahroz, giving local players, many of whom Bahroz represents, an opportunity in the national team, okay, to get that publicity that will secure them deals abroad, which makes Bahroz money. After all, he is the agent of Katanich. So I think that there's a clear conflict of interest, and for us that's a problem, okay? And it might be one of the reasons why players that are expats are not being represented. So you're saying it's the starting lineup at the moment is not Katanich's first choice? No, I'm, I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying uh, Bahroz is having a direct influence. What I'm saying is that Katanich might be subconsciously or consciously making decisions that are in the best interest of his agent, which is Bahroz. Okay? Katanich makes money. Sorry, uh, Bahroz makes money. Katanich does make money. <laughs> Katanich does make money. He's going to make a lot more money once he gets fired soon. <laughs> but Bahroz makes money from players doing well, right? And getting deals abroad. Look at Homam going to Istiqlal, now he's in uh, Egypt. Look at, for example, Bashar and Paraspolis. These are deals that Bahroz has organized. And for these players to get these big deals abroad, they need to be performing well for the national team. That's the only way they're going to get these deals, okay? Nobody really scouts from the Iraq League anymore, or ever really. So we need these, or Bahroz needs these players in the first team selection regularly, showing what they're made of and getting publicity. And Katinich being the manager is a problem because, like I said, there's a conflict of interest. And what am I saying with this in terms of should should Katinich be fired on this alone? No, I'm not implying that. Uh, but I, I think there, there should be an area of discussion regarding how us fans feel about Bahroz and Katinich being in these positions. That's all I'm saying. Bahroz, if you're listening, I love you, man. Don't don't delete my my Instagram. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I'll I think I'll leave on that point. So anyway, we've we've talked a lot, right, about what's happened. Let's talk about the future. I think I think you've talked more than me. I think I have talked a bit more than you, maybe just by a small ratio. But anyway, Iran, Bahrain. What do you think is going to happen realistically? Not what we want. What do we think is going to happen? I think Iran will be fired up 
Iran haven't lost the World Cup qualification game since. So I think they've been unbeaten for 22 games or something ridiculous. They just lost to Bahrain. No, before that. Yeah. So they will be fired up, especially against rivals Iraq. Do you think the the home fans will be able to kind of instill a fear in Iran? Definitely. And Definitely. Because this is a rivalry. This is a classico of Asia. This is entertainment. Think of the Asian Cup. The 3-3. Three, three. Even the nil-nil was entertaining. Yeah. So there will be a lot of action. There will be... Can we hope? I think the, the question everybody's can asking... Can we hold Iran? I think the question everybody's asking is, is Amjad Atwan going to score another screamer? <laughs> if Amjad Atwan scores a 90th minute screamer, I will worship that guy. I will <laughs> happily, happily get, happily get an Amjad Atwan tattoo on my back, okay? I'll be Amjad Atwan super public. fan. <laughs> I'm making this public. If Amjad Atwan... Gets a 90th minute screamer win against Iran. I will get a tattoo of MJ Atwan's face. You know what? I don't including even... the mole <laughs> on my back. No, that's okay? a bit too far. We'll see. But anyway, are we going to beat Iran? Yes or no? Are we going to beat Iran? The question should be, are we going to lose to Iran? And I think if we... Predict somehow, them. somehow, try and stop them. I'm not saying it's impossible. And I'm making it sound like it's harder than it is. Because we have quality players, don't get me wrong. Bahrain beat Iran with an organized team. They aren't more talented than the Iranian players. But if we are on our day, then we can even beat them. But the question is, we need to avoid losing to them. Because if we do lose to them, our competition for second place is greater because our next game will be against Bahrain and that will even add more pressure to get Are Bahrain points. playing uh, one of Cambodia, Hong Kong the next games? They're playing... I think they're playing Cambodia. No, they're playing Hong Kong because they played yeah, they Cambodia play already. So I think they're playing Hong Kong I away. Think, I, think, I think Hong Kong might get a point there. I reckon so. I reckon Hong Kong will get a point against Bahrain. Hong Kong at home are different to Hong Kong away. Even Cambodia yeah. are, are a different team. Also, you got to think of travel because we don't travel. We are staying in Basra. Yeah. Bahrain have to travel to Hong Kong and then to Basra. So yeah. they would have traveled more than us. They would have been more fatigued. I uh, we are. Well, that will be the second leg. Yeah. So uh, hopefully that will work in our advantage. Yep. Yeah. And hopefully the country will be more settled then and um, hoping for a full house in Basra, right? 60,000? Did we have a full house in the West Asian games? It looked Bahrain? like it. It certainly did. I don't think it was the, our first squad. It wasn't our first team, definitely. But I, don't, I wouldn't look too much into that game. We dominate that game, but we really should be winning the game. We'll see. I mean, if we could beat Bahrain... And get a draw against Iran, let's say. That, I'd happily take that. That would pretty much guarantee us qualifying for, for the next round. Would As it, first? Not first, but even second. I think we will go through the next stage and we will go to the final stage of the qualifiers. But do we have enough at this current moment? I don't think so. What about you? Uh, I, to be honest, I'll be happy if we could just qualify from this group. I mean, I, to, to I think you're being too harsh. Listen, when you look back at the Asian Cup, we were knocked out by the champions. Look, I'm not denying that. But again... So we can compete with the big boys. And this is the first time in eight years that we will be playing our qualification games at home. At home, okay. when I mean at home, in Iraq, not in the UAE or All Qatar. Right, fine, maybe I am being cynical, but I don't think that changes much. I don't think, I can't see us qualifying. But let's find out. Guys, thank you so much for listening. Um, if you would like to keep in touch with the Iraq national team, check out my website, iraqfootball.me for Middle East. And uh, follow me on Twitter. My handle is at Iraq underscore football underscore. You could also find me on uh, on Facebook, but I don't really use that much. Instagram at Hassanen, H-A-S-S-A-N-A-N-E. Get in touch. We re really want to hear from you guys. Honestly, the whole point of us doing this podcast is to kind of represent the fans, 
discuss things that are on your minds and we, prob you we probably should have made a disclaimer beforehand and let people know that this is an expert advice this is just two people having a conversation i mean speak for yourself <laughs> i mean you haven't you barely made me let me speak but anyways seriously let us know what you think of the podcast let us know what you'd like us to talk about and i think more than that just let us know what you think of the state of iraqi football we want to hear from you guys all right anyway i'm going to leave it on that hopefully it won't be another four years till you see another podcast we're going to try making this a regular thing but you know uh, we're not getting paid for this we just do this for the love of the game we do this for the love of iraqi fans and we do this for the love of iraqi football i thought i'm getting paid for this we'll discuss that later anyway guys take care bye bye Oh, I'll take